last time we just left off in the text at the title of the Satipatthana method and so today we're just going to continue reading on from there and make sure you grab the text and I will put a link to the text below so you can follow along on your own screen and we're here again today at the Buddha Center in Second Life and we're sitting here by the Buddha and let me just see if the stream looks fine so I hope my sound is alright and that I'm not actually uh, making too much uh, mic noises in this video. So, but whatever. And uh, I think we should start with doing the formal intro before we start reading. And so, let me just pull up the chat and then we're gonna go. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa And for the second time Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa And for a third time Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the Rightly Self-Awakened One. Or, you can do the short version, Namo Buddhasa. And so, let me just turn the camera here, and we should be Oops, that's the wrong way. We should be here, just next to the Buddha. And we're ready for some Dhamma reading. Yeah, so I always get a little into a little bit of trouble finding the right camera angle. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me just try and see here. So we don't actually need that kind of roof over there at the left side. I think it would be nice to have the stupa at the right side. So, let's do it like this. Yeah, and uh, as I said, make sure to pull up the text from the link below this video, and we're gonna get into the actual reading. Continuing on in the text. The Satipatthana method. Because of his mindfulness, a Suttapana can restrain his greed, ill temper, and delusion. He is always on his guard against his latent defilements, which cannot therefore overpower him to the extent of ruining his moral character. 
so he is assured of immunity to gross passions and freedom from fear of the lower worlds. Such are the advantages of mindfulness. The Suttapanna is always mindful because he has regularly practiced mindfulness since the time he started meditating as a good world thing, Kalyana Putjan, Putjana. Indeed, he has disciplined his mind fairly well before he attains the first stage on the holy path. He makes it a practice to note all the psychophysical phenomena that arise from his sensory contact with the external world. This is the Satipatthana, applications of attentiveness. A method that requires the yogi to be aware of all the mental and physical events that occur to him during his meditation. We have simplified the method so that it may not uh, present any difficu difficulty to the yogis. For how can we expect the ordinary ill-informed man to be able to contemplate in detail corporeality, consciousness, mental factors, sita-sika, etc. His contemplation will not lead to anything worthwhile and meaningful in his religious experience. So, we teach the Satipatthana method simply and plainly as did the Buddha. Kachanto wa kachamiti pachanati Know that you are walking when walking. This is the simple instructions of the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutta. It does not say that the yogi should know the fact of walking only after analyzing the inner corporeality, consciousness and so forth. The key Pali word in the Buddha's instruction is Kajami, which needs special attention. It literally means, I go or I walk and should not and should not be translated as mind and body go or walk. So says the venerable Lady Sayada in his Anatapin Anatatipani. A treatise on Anatta doctrine in the posture for carriage of the body, Iriya Patta. One should walk focusing his attention on his feet and noting, I walk. Not a single step should be taken unmindfully. This instruction was criticized by the author of a large book that appeared a year ago. He rejected Lady Sayadaw's explanation on the ground that it refers to the first person, I. I, uh, this is, I, uh, this is tantamount to repudiating the word of the Buddha for the Sayadaw's statement rests entirely on the translation of the Pali word Gajami, and no Pali scholar will deny that his translation is grammatically correct and precise. So, there should be no doubt about the Buddha's explicit instruction in regard to the Satipatthana method for, med <laughs> for meditation. <laughs> I'm sorry. The use of I in different senses. There are three different senses in which people use the pronoun I. 
it may be the reflection of the belief in a soul entity it may be associated with conceit or it may be used as a term of conventional usage the word I as a subject of the uh, verb kachami in the Buddhist sermon has nothing to do with ego illusion or conceit the Buddha and the Arahants too speak of themselves for example I am doing so and so but there is no reason to misunderstand them initially we instruct our yogis to note all phenomena in conventional terms but with the development of concentration all these common urges uh, disappear and when the yogi walks his attention is confined to the mind that desires to walk and physical body that moves in other words there eventually remains only the reality of all phenomena rising and passing away the yogi does not see anything such as form shape or any other sign except the rising and spontaneous dissolution of elements this experience is not limited to the physical objects of sense impressions it applies as well to consciousness uh, which the yogi always finds in a state of flux personal experience we assure every yogi of this experience if he seriously practices meditation according to our instructions we do not blame the skeptics who have never tried the Satipatthana method for only seeing is believing and their skepticism is due to lack of experience to speak the truth I myself was a non-believer at one time in 1931 when I had been a member of the Sangha for eight years I heard that Mingun Sitawun Sayada was teaching the Satipatthana method of meditation in Tatun. At first I was not much interested as the, as the method made no mention of Nama Rupa, Anicca, Anatta, body mind or mind body, uh, impermanence and non self and requires the yogi only to be aware of what he is thinking, feeling or doing. But later on I had second thoughts about this method. The method is rather odd, but the Sayada is a highly learned monk and he claims to have applied it throughout thoroughly for many years before preaching it. So there may be more to it than being attentive to one's action actions. So I decided to pass judgment only after giving it a trial. Meditating under the Sayada's guidance, I applied the Satipatthana method. In the, fir in the first month, I made no progress in my search for insight knowledge. And this was not surprising because I did not meditate seriously. By contrast, some of my disciples developed tranquility to some extent after five or six days after five or six days practice and became fairly and well familiar with the nature of nama rupa um, mind and body or body and mind but more correctly mind and body anicca impermanence anatta non-self etc. As for me, 
even after a month my understanding was nil because of lack of faith and energetic effort. Lack of faith implies skeptical doubt, which is kitcha, which is a barrier to the Aryan noble path and enlightenment. It's one of the five hindrances, doubt. It is of paramount importance to remove this barrier, but at that time I did not take it seriously, and in my view, attentiveness to movements of uh, the physical body was linked with attachment to conventional usage usages that had little bearing on ultimate reality Paramatta perhaps the Sayadaw's instruction was a prelude to analysis of Nama Rupa of, of the body and mind phenomena which he would deal with in his later sermons so thinking and hoping I failed to practice wholeheartedly and did not have any unusual experience in my meditation. Later on, however, I reassessed the Sayadaw's method and at last I realized its significance. It is the most effective way since it entails attentiveness to everything that is to be known, leaving no room for the for mind wandering. I now appreciate the Buddha's saying which describes the Satipatthana method as the only way to liberation. Ikkayano Makko the one where the one way or the way that leads one way the one leading way. Development of Tranquility At the beginning, the yogi treats the sense data as the raw material for meditation and makes a mental note of walking, sitting, lying, bending, etc. Then, as concentration develops, he becomes aware of all psychophysical events that occur to him. The vanishing of the units of consciousness is clear as the beats dro uh, dropping one after another. Some have this experience in two stages some in three stages through constant uh, observation of the dissolution of all phenomena he finds nothing that is worthwhile and pleasant nothing that gives ground for ego belief still there are some people who talk nonsense about our method and thereby disparaging the Buddha and his teaching we have been giving instructions since our arrival at this uh, meditation center and no matter who say and no matter who says what to discredit our medita our method we are unshaken because our conviction is the outcome of experience just after our arrival in Yangon Young gone. A man started attacking using a newspaper. We do not know of his motive and we never refuted his criticism. We went on our way, assuming that beginners in meditation would go to him or come to us according to their inclinations. Thus, exercising, exercising prudence, yoni sumanasikara, we carried on with our work, and before long, his newspaper stopped coming out for some unknown reason. That was good for those who wished to meditate seriously, 
but he continued to attack us by writing a book. We now take no interest in whatever he is doing. Of course, we welcome anybody's effort to promote the Buddha's teaching. Hmm. Of course, we welcome anybody's effort to promote the Buddha's teaching. If now there were an extraordinary man who could perform miracles to attract other countries to Buddhism, he would surely receive the overwhelming support of our people. It makes little sense, however, for a man without any practice or experience to criticize those who, procl who proclaim the Buddhist method on the basis of their own thorough practice and experience. The Empirical Approach Students at our center are instructed to focus on every phenomena arising from the six sense organs before they can note all six sense objects. They concentrate on bodily behavior. In particular, the yogi's first exercise consists in consciously making a note of the rising and falling of the belly. Later on, I will, I will explain the rationale for this exercise on the basis of the Buddha's teaching. The yogi's mindfulness should not be restricted to the rising and falling. He should also note his feelings, <coughs> thinking, imagining, etc as well as all bodily actions. The yogi who, who thus practices mindfulness thoroughly and steadfastly is always aware of his six sense impressions. Then he is in tune with the Arya Vasa Dhammas that stress the need for the guard of mindfulness. Sattarakena Chetasa Sammanya Gatto I don't know what that means. Some people contended that a comprehensive course of lessons on Nama Rupa, Anicca, etc in conjugation with meditation will help the yogis understand the Buddhist concepts more easily. But the ideas which the yogis would absorb thereby are only perceptions, sanya, and have hardly anything to do with empirical knowledge. Such preconceived notions are misleading in that they often make it difficult to to distinguish between truth and falsehood. So there are non-Buddhists who have a low opinion of Buddhist meditation. They say that Buddhists blindly believe in impermanence, suffering and impersonality of life as a result of the preconceptions implanted in them by their religious teachers. But this is not true of our yogi disciples. For although we tell them the meaning of anicca, dukkha and so forth, we never elucidate or instruct them how to fix the Pali concepts in their minds. They only note all the phenomena as they really are. They follow our instructions and later on report to us how they become aware of the distinction between mind and body and the ceaseless passing away of the knowing consciousness and the knowing sense impressions. Only then do we recognize it as real insight knowledge, vipassana jnana, and help the yogis understand their experience in terms of Buddhist concepts.
real empirical knowledge. Thus, the knowledge which the yogis acquire at our meditation center is based not on preconceived notions, but on personal experience. Knowledge gained in this way is not vague and misty, but quite, oh, sorry, but quite clear and distinct. The yogi sees sense objects and consciousness not in terms of shape, size, or substance, but only as rising and passing away. When he tells us about his experience, we let him know that it is called Vanka insight. Experience is followed by explanation on the part of the teacher and not the other way around. We do not tell him in advance what he is to see or experience in the course of meditation as he keeps on meditating. As he keeps on meditating he becomes more and more mindful until his mindfulness becomes solid and viable at the last stage on the Aryan Noble Path. Mindfulness is labeled a security guard in the Buddha's talk in the Aryavasa Sutta. It is indispensable to the yogi at every thought moment. Without it, the yogi cannot become a suttapana, let alone an arahant. So it is up to the yogi to be mindful of his actions and reactions, emotions, impulses, and so forth. Constant practice of mindfulness helps him develop tranquility and sharpen the intellect. It means dwelling in the Aryan abode that ensures security and protection from the perils of life cycles. In order to reside in the Aryan abode, we must be prepared to pay the price in terms of faith, aspiration and effort. It is impossible to do anything without faith, satta. The yogi practices mindfulness only because he is convinced of its being essential to the emergence of insight knowledge. But faith in itself will be to no avail without a strong desire to attain the Aryan path and Nibbana. It is necessary, too, to exert strenuous, unrelenting effort in the practice of the Dhamma. For the man who possesses these three qualities, every moment of mindfulness means temporary residence in the Aryan abode. Gratis free. That's funny. Gratis means free in Danish. So it essentially says uh, for a man who possesses these three qualities, every moment of mindfulness means temporary residence in the Aryan abode, free, free. <laughs> anyway, gratis probably means something else in English. Continuing on. At the very least, he is protected from the danger of hell as he is uh, borne out by the following story. Oh, I'm sorry, as is borne out by the following story. The story of Tambara of who again? The story of Tamparatika. Tamparatika. Okay. In the lifetime of the Buddha, th there was in the city of Rajagaha a public executioner named Tamparatika. It was the official duty of this man to execute thieves and robbers, condemned to death by the law courts. He went on doing his duty every day until his mid-fifties when he retired from state service. This was sanctioned by the state. 
horrible. On the day of his retirement, he made preparations to enjoy certain things such as drinking milk gruel, wearing new brand garments, etc. that were taboo to him when he was in service. This prohibition may seem ridiculous nowadays, but anyway, it is human nature to crave for forbidden things and so Tamparatika, Tamparatika was bent on fulfilling his long suppressed desire. So he want to look good. Then, by means of his psychic power, the venerable Sariputta knew that death, that death was just around the corner for Tampariti for Tampatatika. The man would die soon after drinking the milk gruel. He had not done any good deed. While on the other hand, the consequence of his overwhelming uh, evil deeds, he was very likely to suffer in hell after death. Moved with compassion, the Terra decided to do, them do something for his salvation and stopped at his house while on the round for collection of food. Tampadatika was then about to drink the milk gruel, and if he uh, uh, had lacked faith and ignored the Terra, it would have spelled disaster for him in his afterlife. But inspired with strong faith, he promptly offered the food to the Terra and sat nearby respectfully. As the Terra was aware of his intense craving for food, he told Tamparatika to gratify it. After availing, him after availing himself of, his of this permission, Tamparatika came back to hear the Terra sermon. The Buddha Dhamma is delicate and it is up to the Aryan disciple to preach it skillfully, bearing in mind the, var the varying su subtlety of each doctrine. The Terra's talk began with almsgiving and proceeded to morality. The observance of the five precepts that lead to longevity, prosperity, and so forth in the future. Then the Tara spoke of the word of Dewas and talked about insight meditation. which involves constant mindfulness that keeps us on guard against unwholesome thoughts. I just had to read this sentence for myself first, so I could actually say it. Oh no! Okay. Tamparatika was upset by the terror's subtle talk that helped revive memories of his unpleasant past. The Terra knew what was passing in his mind. But still he asked the man why did he not appear to be fussed uh, that remorse and anxiety lay heavy on his consciousness and made him unhappy. The Terra then asked him whether he had committed the evil deeds of his own free will and the former chief executioner replied that he had carried out the order of the king against I'm sorry against his will then how could these evil deeds be yours said the Terra we should here consider the Terra's uh, question deeply it did not deny the moral responsibility of Tampat 
for the execution of the convicts. The question was cleverly designed to ease his conscience and make him attentive to the sermon. In reality, an evil deed is always potentially harmful to the doer in the round of rebirth, no matter whether it is committed deliberately or at the instigation of someone else. Of course, the comic consequences may be grave or light, depending on the strength of volition associated with the deed. But Tamparatika was not intelligent enough to see the point. He, con he concluded that he would not have to suffer for the deeds for which only the king was responsible. This conviction laid his anxiety at rest and helped him follow the sermon. I'm just scrolling in the text just a second. There we go. In connection with the story in connection with this story, a man in Schwebo once joked that low intelligence is sometimes good for us because uh Okay, so I'm just going to read what it says. In connection with this story, a man in Schwebo once joked that low intelligence is sometimes good for us because, but for it, there would have been no end to Tamparatika's worry and anxiety. Doesn't make sense in my head. That sentence right there. Um, anyway. But the example of Tamparatika is not to be emulated by our disciples, who should rely on scriptures and well-informed people to improve their intelligence and knowledge. Having listened to the sermon attentively, Tamparatika eventually attained anulomana, anulomanyana, adaptive knowledge that denotes all kinds of inside knowledge ranging from sammasana jnana to advanced sankara what? to advanced sankarupika jnana or the insight knowledge that emerges prior to the attainment of the path. It is hard to determine the kind of insight knowledge that was really gained by Tamparatika. According to the commentary, it seems to be the Sankarupika insight knowledge preceding the attainment of the first stage, Suttapana, on the path. It is said that the Bodhisattvas in the Holy Order meditated till they gained the Anulomanyana, but theirs is not the Anulomanyana on the path process. Makawiti. The attainment of the Anuloma knowledge of the path process means the outright attainment of the path and its fruition, Pala. The process of enlightenment does not end with the arising of Anuloma insight. Moreover, the Bodhisattva can achieve the ultimate goal of the path only when he is about to become a Buddha. He cannot achieve it in his early lives. So, we should assume the Anuloma insight of Tamparatika to be Sankara Upeka, equanimity insight knowledge, at the early stage in the round of rebirth. It may also be oh I'm sorry. It may be also the ordinary insight knowledge or at the very least Samasasa Samasana Samasana jnana. What 
whatever it is. It means mindfulness, which is the real passport to the abode of the Aryas. Having thus provided Tambaratika with protection against rebirth in the lower worlds, the venerable Tera Sariputta left the house Tambaratika, went out to see. Okay, so again, I'm just gonna try and read this a little bit better. Starting over. Having thus provided uh, Tambaratika with protection against rebirth in the lower worlds, the venerable Tera Sariputta left the house. Tambaratika went out to see the Tera off, see, see the Tera off, but on the way back he was gored to death by a cow that was an ogress in disguise, who had a grudge against him, the man, who had a grudge against the man in a previous life. That is what the Dhammapada commentary says, but of course skeptics may say that it was just an ordinary cow. So Sariputta gave him the Sankara Upekka. Sankara Upekka. He put him in a state of equanimity just before he died so he would not go to a bad destination after birth. But yeah, I mean, I was really kind of Sariputta because this man with low intelligence obviously was not even elated to the point of actually extinguishing. But maybe he performed horrible, horrible comma. It's not really for me to comment on that. Let me just see here. Heard some sound. Looks fine. Yeah, that's fine. back to the text here. The death of Tamparatika was the topic of conversation among the monks. They were surprised when the Buddha told them about his rebirth in Tusita heaven, one of the six deva worlds that was reputed as the abode of the bodhisattvas. Tamparatika was assured of a bright future, which he owed to his having a good friend in the person of venerable Sariputta, whose sermon helped him acquire the Anuloma Jnana. But for his un oh, I'm sorry, but for his mindfulness at the last moment of life, he would have landed in one of the lower worlds. Okay, so he, if you hadn't been mindful, he would have gone to a bad destination. In fact, he had a narrow escape from hell, says the text. Rebirth in the Deva world is certain for those who practice the Dhamma wholeheartedly and zealously. Some former yogis tell us how much mindfulness helps alleviate their suffering when they are seriously ill. Through constant practice, mindfulness may become spontaneous, as in the case of the Brahmin lady Dhananjani, a Suttapana disciple of the Buddha. On one occasion, her husband warned her not to extol the Buddha while his Brahmin teachers were being entertained. Yet, uh, when she tripped, she uttered thrice the sacred formula Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Praise to the Blessed One the worthy one and the rightly self-awakened one, etc. Thus, through assiduous practice of the Dhamma, mindfulness automatically arises in the face of suffering or imminent death. As for those 
who have had no such experience, they would be well advised to try practicing mindfulness. Once they have savored the, its benefits, they will find its appeal irresistible, just like the veteran yogis at our meditation center. The four main stays. The yogi who cultivates mindfulness should have uh, four requisites, namely clothes, food, medicine and a dwelling. These are absolutely essential because they are the basic necessities of life. Indeed, they constitute the first mainstay of his Aryan abode. He he is prudent and intelligent in his reliance on the four requisites, always being in mind that he needs them not for his pleasure but for his well-being. Thus, he wears, he wears clothes for propriety, lives in an abode for protection from rain, heat and cold eats food and takes medicine for the maintenance of health. He is intelligent enough to know the right quality and quantity of food uh, he needs and the time to take it. To deny oneself the basic needs of life means self-mortification, which is called Atta Kilamatam. Hmm. It is called, I'm sorry, Atta Kilamatanu Yogas. Atta Kilamatanu Yoga. Atta, atta ki Atakilamatanu yogas in Pali. In the time of the Buddha, Tera Okay, uh, I'm just gonna read what it says. In the time of the Buddha, Tera were Nikat Nikanta Achiwakas and other heretics who devoted themselves to ascetic practices. Even the Buddha himself practiced austerities in the early years of his life as an, ex as an ascetic in the forest. He adopted such habits as surpassing his in and out breathing. I'm sorry, as suppressing his in and out breathing. Eating very little food etc. Later on he realized the futility of asceticism, gave it up and following the middle way attained supreme enlightenment. At present the Jains in India are still the devotees of asceticism, but asceticism as well as overindulgence in sensual pleasure is incompatible with Buddhism which proclaims the middle way between the two extremes. It is therefore up to the yogi to consider and determine the proper thing and the proper time to do for his own welfare and of course this means right thinking based on right mindfulness. The second mainstay of the Aryan abode is the fortitude of mind that makes the yogi invulnerable to mental and physical pain. He should be capable of enduring heat, cold, sound, voices and other sensations that trouble him. He is troubled not really. Some people cannot bear any pain. As soon as they feel uncomfortable, 
they cease to be mindful and seek to relieve their discomfort, thereby impeding the progress in meditation. The yogi should be prepared to practice higher meditation even at the risk of his life. Here, some people may think that the Buddha Dhamma makes unreasonable demands on them. But this statement is aimed at encouraging the yogi to do his utmost for his spiritual welfare. As a matter of fact, there is no case of illness, not to mention death. Uh, resulting from strenuous practice of meditation. On the contrary, there are some people who recovered from ill health through meditation and their number is quite considerable. A woman who came to our center recently said that she had a troublesome, a troublesome lump in her womb that made it impossible for her to sit for a long time. A doctor had advised her to have the, loom, the lump removed, but she decided to take up meditation before surgical operation. Her meditation teacher told her to take it easy and meditate in a relaxed frame of mind. Under the guidance of the teacher, she made some progress in meditation and at last her illness evaporated surprisingly. She was then able to sit for a long time without feeling any pain. She went to the doctor for another checkup. After ex examining her, the doctor said that she did not need any operation as she had gotten rid of her lump. And so, the yogi should exercise forbearance as far as possible in the face of suffering. He must, of course, do the needful when the pain is unbearable. Forbearance leads to Nibbana, says a Myanmar proverb, and indeed it is vital to the uh, successful practice of meditation. If the meditating yogi fidgets and becomes restless whenever he feels uncomfortable. He will not be able to concentrate and without concentration he can never realize Nirvana. The third and fourth mainstays. The third mainstay of the Aryan abode is avoidance. The yogi should give a wide breath. Oh, wait a minute. Birth? The yogi should give a wide birth to all potential dangers such as vicious animals, cars driven by reckless drivers, or places where he runs the risk of meeting with an accident. Even a trivial misha mishap like being pierced by the horn by thorn. Even a trivial mishap like being pierced by a thorn may mean a serious setback in meditation. The Buddha himself cautioned the monks against visiting dangerous places unwarily. He sh he told them not to do, uh, he told them not to be foolishly overconfident because of their practice of meditation. In particular, the yogis should be on his guard against intimate relationship with the opposite sex. This precaution is especially necessary in the case of monks who may otherwise lie open to the false charge of moral impurity. But it's still a false charge, right? Anyway, 
The fourth mainstay of the Aryan abode is the elimination of unwholesome thoughts, vitakka. These unhealthy states of consciousness are of three kinds, namely sensuous karma thoughts, malicious vipada thoughts, and aggressive or violent vihimsa thoughts. The yogi should dispel unwholesome thoughts about sensual objects, about how to ruin other people, or how to inflict suffering on them. It is very difficult to overcome these thoughts because, in fact, most people enjoy harboring them. <coughs> Sorry. It gives them pleasure to think of the thought. Oh, I'm sorry. It gives them pleasure to think of the objects of their attachment, the people they would li like to see, or the plans for the fulfillment of their desires. They fret at what they regard as restrictions of their freedom. This is not surprising because, except for the meditating yogis, most people let their minds wander freely when they have nothing to do. The yogis usually accustomed to restrictions in due course. I'm sorry. The yogis usually get accustomed to restrictions in due course and find it beneficial to their mental culture. In fact, you know, it takes only a few days practice to acquire the habit of watchfulness that keeps a yogi on guard against unwholesome thoughts. Some westerners at our meditation center do not know much about our system, but they have faith that arouses in their interest in it. The trouble is that they are fond of reading and writing. We advise them to give up the, this habit during their stay at the center because it gives rise to discursive thinking that forms an obstacle to concentration and the development of insight knowledge. At first, it was difficult for them to show. I'm sorry. At first, it was difficult for them to follow our advice, but they got used to the restriction in due course and found it conducive to their mind training. That's a funny term, mind training. Um, one such foreigner was Mr. Dual, an American who spent several months at several months at the center, practicing mindfulness initially as a lay yogi and later on as a monk. He was much impressed by, Satipatthana, by the Satipatthana method that helped him to attain insight into the ultimate reality of life. According to him, there is no reliable system of mental culture in Europe and America. A deficiency in the, West, in the Western way of life that has deprived their people of inner peace despite their material prosperity. He said that on his return he would help them to be happy through Satipatthana meditation. And this concludes uh, this episode on the Aryavasa and we just crossed for three seconds about one hour and 108 and so we're going to end this episode here um, where we just left off um, with the third and the fourth mainstays um, of the Arya Vasa or the Aryan abode so yeah ending off today with a Dhamma on the four mainstays namely 
let's just see what they translated it as Okay, so they are clothes and food and medicine and a shelter. And next time on the third uh, episode of this video series, we're going to continue with five hindrances. And so I would like to say thank you so much for listening and may you find true peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. And let's just try and pay homage to the Buddha once more, three times. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa and for a third time Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa and yeah let me just see if I can we started well, somewhere around here so yeah thank you for listening and make sure you check out um, the first episode of this series on the Arya Vasa, the abode of the Aryas. And until next time, may much peace and happiness and freedom be yours. Thank you. So I'm just gonna do like four minutes of meditation and so we're going to make this video one hour and eight minutes long as far as possible and let's do four minutes of meditation and I can just yeah I'm just gonna continue sitting with my avatar in the listening position even though I am now about to meditate and you should put your right hand on top of your left hand and sit in the cross-legged position or any position that is comfortable and makes it possible for you to keep concentration during the meditation.
once again, thank you so much for listening, and uh, make sure to check out the next episode when it comes out. Thanks. Peace.